uh, Eric is quite right to refer to the fact that we work together. We put a bid into the research councils to try and produce a roadmap out to 2050 for Cambridge and Greater Manchester as to how all of these things would happen. If you saw the referees' reports, I tried it again recently, and one of the referees' reports has come back saying this problem is irreducibly difficult, and therefore don't bother, go and do something more useful. So that's what my peer group of academics think about. My concern, in fact, was to actually look at this whole problem through a, 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 a pair of spectacles that were filtered with the word engineering. Because one of the concerns that my colleague David uh, Mackay has pointed out is that much of the discussion that goes on in Whitehall is uh, discussion in the absence of numbers. And I've spent all my time uh, working on numbers. Now, um, this is just a bit about me, but I just want to point down to the last two. I come back from electronic engineering, and in fact my first introduction to Salford was the Van de Graaff accelerator, which has just been demolished to, um, uh, to um, uh, make way for the building, because it was the key uh, to uh, iron implantation technology, and this was certainly one of the centres in the early days. But most of what I want to say is uh, prompted by the fact that I did spend... Um, three years uh, as Chief Scientific Advisor, and much of that to Hazel Blears, in fact, from this area. So what I want to do today is talk about the drivers of ref retrofit. You've heard one or two, but I want to add a point, so I want to add to it, and the scale of retrofit, and then I want to just talk about the possibility of retrofitting Cambridge. And I'll talk about the engineering scale, and then some of the financial and societal uh, considerations. When you look at that, you can see some of the quandaries and hurdles some of the potential benefits, and then I've got one slide of conclusions. Now, just so you know, um, about 40% of the talk will be on that first point. Now, the Climate Change Committee, um, in a, an act of, uh, advised an 80% reduction of CO2, which has been um, uh, enshrined in legislation. This is the only country where, where it was done. This was announced without any engineering reality assessment and without either a route map or an indicative budget. And I personally think some of the problems we're facing today follow from just that. Uh, there is one engineer on the Climate Change Committee, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Aston, who is a specialist in the internal combustion engine, is quite clearly well placed to make comments on one section of it. But as has been commented uh, today, the buildings are, are much the largest. Over the, my time, I generally start, uh, used to use energy security as the real urgent and large-scale reason for action, and I have a few slides to make uh, you uh, clear as to why this is the case. But in the last year, things have been changing. Um, if you actually uh, are interested in these things, there was a meeting of gas suppliers in Paris only about uh, six weeks before Christmas, and uh, the reserves that have been proven now on shale gas are indicating a possible glut of gas for 100 years. Now, if we do have a glut of gas for 100 years internationally, and by the way, there's some, some of it's been discovered in this country, so and America hopes to be um, self-sufficient in, in this uh, uh, soon, uh, there is the real possibility that prices of energy will cont continue so to be very low over the next few decades, things that we would like, but it drives a coach and horses through some of the problems that we've posed about how we would pay back a retrofit. Now, whatever happens, a more sustainable consumption of resources, including more efficient use of energy, is highly desirable anyway. And if you actually look at the, um, what's required between now and 2050, we're going to be talking about a fairly complete renewal of the civil infrastructure because 45% of, of energy is used heating air and water in buildings, 33% in transport, and 50% of our water is used in homes. And 40 years is an interesting period, as I'll refer to at the end, because that's the period roughly of the first industrial revolution. And when you look at the great engineers such as Bazalgette, um, um, uh, Brunel, and others, and saw what they did in a, a short period, and the way the... Um, the uh, Manchester Ship Canal was built, and the number of houses that were built between uh, 1850 and 1890, then you suddenly see that uh, some of the things we want to do have been done before, and it just needs a political uh, will. By the way, nearly all that was done under the private sector, so the possibility of doing it this time under the private sector is something which I think is highly attractive. These are the numbers um, uh, that just bear out what I said a minute ago. Now, I want to just say something about the electricity supply today, <clears throat> because here are some of the problems. 
We have uh, a capacity of uh, 75 gigawatts, peak capacity. That's if every turbine that's connected to the grid was turned on and running. The peak demand in each of the last three winters, including just before this, um, uh, during Christmas, uh, before Christmas here, uh, is about 60 gigawatts. But 12 gigawatts, or 15% of capacity of coal and oil-fired generating power plants are due to close by 2016 as part of a 2008 EU large combustion plant directive, uh, which is aimed at cutting emissions. There are also plans to decommission uh, 7.4 gigawatts by 2020 and 9.8 by 2023 of nuclear power, leaving only size will be of the current uh, nuclear fleet in operation. So in total, we're going to be getting rid of about 30% of our existing capacity by 2020, and uh, nearly <coughs> just short of 50% by 2027. <coughs> and this has to be replaced. Renewables only provide 5% of the energy uh, capacity today, well below target, and this will not replace baseload. Tidal is a possible um, exception. So whatever happens about energy supply, demand reduction is essential. I want to show you this graph. Um, <coughs> the left one is uh, from a a web page uh, which is referred there. The one on the right is from colleagues in the Renewable Energy Foundation. The, the slide on the left shows the rate at which wind turbines are being uh, installed in the United Kingdom, offshore and onshore. <coughs> but if you take half hour periods uh, last year and look at the best and worst that wind can do, on the 6th of September last year, when we were <coughs> after uh, 25. <coughs> gigawatts of energy at 5 o'clock in the morning, 3.5 came from uh, wind. That's in green. <coughs> On the 7th of December last year, which you'll probably remember with fond memory, when we needed 60 gigawatts, where we hit the peak, uh, we only had 0.3 gigawatts from wind. It was a still, quiet, cold day. So I think engineering reality has got to get somewhere seriously into this place, and I'm afraid that I'm uh, deeply concerned that it's, um, it's not. <coughs> now, the government has a, an interesting comment here. This is from the Treasury, saying, significant new investment is, however, planned on onshore and offshore. Under current investment plans, around 10,000 gigawatts of new gas and renewable generation is under construction, and further uh, 11 gigawatts has been given permission. But at this minute, only one-third of the uh, permitted wind farms are actually being implemented, and uh, E.ON uh, has just mothballed a couple of its uh, coal-fired power stations, saying they're not necessary. And we have a real problem in this country that we have, apart from Scottish, we have no, in the United Kingdom at least, we have, uh, Britain, England rather, get it right, um, we have no national champion at the moment. There is uh, rumours that E.ON is looking to sell. Get it. So we have a serious problem about our energy supply, and I think this level of um, confidence is complacency, because it's that grey wedge uh, that is going to have to be replaced. <coughs> this is the national grid's view of what they think will happen over that period, <coughs> and you'll notice that if you take coal combined cycle gas turbines <coughs> and that, that uh, even out to 2030, <coughs> over half of our energy is still going to be provided by fossil fuels wind, uh, other renewables, nuclear, and so on. <coughs> There's also a mix there. These slides will be available so you can see them afterwards. The mix of various things that will be uh, made uh, in terms of the uh, connected generation capacity. Now, I want to just add to this problem, <coughs> and it's like this. This is a slide which talks about the installation of solar thermal in Japan. The, dashed, the dotted line with the, the curve with the dots on it is the spot price of oil, and you noticed in the 1970s there was a, uh, an oil crisis, and the Japanese started putting uh, these black, ugly things onto their roofs, solar thermal. Remember the Japanese roofs, those you've visited, are beautiful ceramic tiles. <coughs> and uh, once the price came down, they stopped doing it. <coughs> And ever since, uh, this industry has been dying in Japan. The Japanese have comprehensively fallen out of love with a poor and underperforming solar thermal technology. And you now see the second peak and not a boo from a solar thermal. So there's a lesson here that if we start pushing things and taking expectation based on hype, which is not backed by serious 
engineering competence, we're heading for trouble. And um, I just leave you to um, uh, contemplate that. Now I want to concentrate. So all I'm just saying there is that the situation about our primary energy supply is not one that uh, fills me with great comfort. And now I want to talk about the housing stock. <coughs> Much of it is old and not well insulated. <coughs> so here are the numbers. There are 22 million homes in the United Kingdom, <coughs> of which uh, 5 million, uh, and, and there are also 5 million non-domestic buildings. 33% of these were built uh, before 1900, about 33% in the period after the war, and the rest um, between the wars and uh, since 1970. <coughs> In both of those, first and second, third, <coughs> they were built at a time of cheap coal and cheap oil, which meant that the thermal envelope of the building itself was not considered a vital aspect of the design, important but not vital. And contrast that with the situation in uh, Iberia or Scandinavia, where any building is built knowing that at a certain point of the year you must keep energy in or out, heat in or out. And, uh, <coughs> By contrast, our houses um, seem to have the worst of all worlds. If we now think that there will be two interventions per house between now and 2050 in the retrofitting mode, this means that one million houses a year need to be retrofitted, not 100,000 or so. So any time in my time as a scientific advisor, I said I was not interested in one house or 10 houses or 1,000. I wanted to see something that started at 100,000 houses and scale up because less than that, we're dealing with something which is bound to undershoot the targets. <clears throat> to give you a scale also, <clears throat> um, at the moment, there are about 350,000 houses which have a conservatory or um, some significant upgrade, another room, something that really represents, uh, <clears throat> other than a, a retrofit in terms of energy conditions uh, or upgrades, on a business-as-usual basis. So this means if we take all the people who do general renovations, and by that I don't mean just a slap of paint, but a serious renovations of buildings, we have to treble that workforce if we're going to have over 40 years, if we're going to do this uh, program. So there's a start. Now this is the slide that um, I used last time, and Eric remembers. This is a, a, the fact that it's got a star beside there means that uh, Hazel Blairs and several other ministers uh, at CLG at the time in fact, John Denham was the only one who actually got this. Uh, he had him to be a chemist, so he saw the numbers. What I want to do here is to show you uh, two periods of 15 years, from 1990 to 2005, and 2005 to 2020, remembering that we're one-third of the way through that second period already. In 1990, 154 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent was emitted from the existing housing stock, and by 2005, that had fallen to 147 million tonnes. That was a 4% drop. But that was net of many factors, because in that period, there was a 12% increase in the number of houses, and a 4% increase in the population, and a very steep rise in the amount of electricity used in homes for such things as electronics, plasma screens, and uh, various other things. So against that prevailing upward uh, curve, there was a 4% drop in the carbon emissions from the built environment. Now, why is that? Well, if you take this basket of measures down here, of three inches of loft insulation, 60% of windows double glazed by area, 60% of rooms draft proof by volume, and uh, cavity wall insulation installed to modern standards where appropriate, and you look at the state of the housing stock in 1990, you find that about 35% of the existing stock had those measures in place, and those buildings were benefiting from the quality of the thermal envelope. And on a business-as-usual case, that went up to 65% by, uh, uh, by 2005. Now, the point I kept telling the ministers is that by 2020, the, the target for the housing stock within the climate change requirements is to get that number down to 114 million tonnes. And that is, a, we've, got to change, we've got to achieve savings in this 15-year period of six times the net rate that we did in uh, recent history. Now, um, if we actually take that number from 65 out to 100, we'll only get about another 20% saving maximum. So it's clear that these standards themselves are nowhere near good enough. <coughs> In fact, we can do better. <coughs> so we'll exhaust this, these current measures at, at the rate we're going on a business as usual case within eight to 10 years. 
And so the existing buildings are only going to meet their uh, 2050 targets. If we have new measures to improve on the thermal envelope, this will be materials, methods of installation, uh, controls, etc. Controls probably being very important. Decarbonising of the grid and other sources of energy, and there's plenty of political will and discussion about that. Improving the energy efficiency of appliances, which is happening slowly. And then changes in personal attitudes and behaviour concerning <coughs> profligate energy consumption. Since I arrived in this country in 1971, our attitudes towards drink driving and smoking in public unconfined places have changed. Not only our attitudes, but our behaviours. <clears throat> and we have to get somewhere to the fact that when we see a Lamborghini, we sneer at the driver rather than leer at him at, at the moment. It's simply that that is a profligate use of energy. And so unless we get somewhere in that space, <coughs> we're in trouble. Now, here's another thing that talks about behaviour. This is from a colleague of mine, <coughs> excuse me, Professor Yang at uh, Tsinghua University. This shows the use of energy, electricity consumption of 18 flats, one after e under each other, in an 18-floor building in uh, um, Beijing for um, air conditioning over a particular summer. And you see quite a range there. And you could imagine the top one being underneath the, the roof being very hot. <coughs> This is all entirely due to the different ways in which um, people live. He said a number of these that are very low are occupied by people who are 60 plus, who grew up without air conditioning and don't particularly need it now. Um, speculating whether some of these tall ones were um, yuppies back from America. But <coughs> and here's another one which I think is also fascinating from him. This compares a downtown building in Beijing with a campus building in the United States. And the, the graph in the middle there shows that the temperature profile around the year of Philadelphia and Beijing are pretty well identical. They're both about 80 miles inland from the eastern seaboard of a large continental building. <coughs> but here is the uh, use of energy <coughs> per square metre for cooling um, the, uh, the building in America and uh, China, for heating the building in America and China, and the uh, electricity used in that building. <coughs> <coughs> and this is entirely due to the controls and the way, the fact, this build, the Chinese building is turned off in the evening and weekends and so on. So there is a lot of scope to be done just beyond the technology. So those are the drivers and the scale of the problem. I now want to just concentrate for a few minutes on um, the idea that I'm working on at the moment is to say what happens if we were to retrofit Cambridge. And the context for doing this is there's a yawning gap between the rhetoric and action at scale. Uh, and a reminder that much of the UK urban infrastructure, city urban structure as we know it now, was built in 40 years during the Industrial Revolution. Um, Granger, I think, is the name in um, Newcastle. Every city has one. And if I'd done my homework before I came up, I'd have told you who it was for Manchester. But uh, we had... <coughs> Thanks very much for that. Good. So why not just do it in Cambridge? Because we've got uh, universities, we've got the city, the business community, they're all got their strengths, but we're all in it together and have got quite a lot of enthusiasm for this. And if we don't try and take the lead, who will? We have all the advantages and disadvantages of first mover uh, involvement. And we could use our brand to draw in a lot of collaborators in engineering. <coughs> and we have even the Greater Cambridge Partnership, which is the proper governance umbrella. <coughs> so here's the scale for Cambridge. 86% of the CO2 footprint in Cambridge city comes from buildings. <coughs> uh, there's a lot of cycling and walking in Cambridge, and it does actually make that difference that transport is very small. 41,000 homes and 5,500 domestic buildings. If we were to bring all those buildings up to warm front standards and code level C in terms of sustainability for non-domestic buildings, it would cost about £600 million, and it would produce somewhere between a 20 and 30, 25 and 30% reduction in carbon emissions. But here's the <coughs> bottleneck. If we were to try and do this in a period of 10 years, and because, you remember, this is only one-third of the way up to the 80% uh, <coughs> uh, reduction, we'd need to increase the number of builders from 15 to 1,500 to 4,500 <coughs> and to treble the capacity of the supply chain. <coughs> and, of course, if we were to be retrofitting in addition to building as usual, then we would need 4,500 new builders uh, and quadruple mm -hmm. builders. 
One of the very interesting questions which you look at is ward level interventions for effectiveness and efficiency. I happen to live in a street of terraced houses. There's 80 of them, all four, store, all four floors <coughs> uh, in, a, in a city. And half of them are owned by the college, or no, more than half, two thirds of them are owned by one college or another and let out to students, and the rest of us own them privately. <coughs> Now, if I spent 25 or 30,000 pounds doing up my house and then the university and the colleges together get to long and say they want to spend 25,000 per street and do something better, but I insist that I don't want any of their pipes coming under my place or anything else, I can make it very difficult for them. <coughs> so one of the questions that we're going to have to face of doing anything on an <coughs> urban scale is uh, how do we get the ward level and the democratic buy-in? <coughs> And in addition to this, uh, when you've done the sums, there is another alternative you see which uh, you can look at and say, well, why don't we just not rush anything now, spend the next 10 years and plan for it like D-Day, but really do it all in the 1920s, but we'll be in a much better place by 2030 if we plan for it properly. So that's a, a slightly different way of tackling it. For example, what would happen if we developed an external transparent clip-on cladding that you could just go along with a laser rangefinder and photograph the street, cherry pickers over the back of buildings, go off site, measure it, and then clip it on a few weeks later. Now, lots of people will put their hands up in horror saying it's, um, it's um, <coughs> unacceptable, it's anaesthetic or something like that. But if we're fronting some of these issues and it's in the law, then uh, we <coughs> these are the sort of things we have to think of. So should we do nothing for five, ten years and then plan to do something? <coughs> Now, <coughs> now, the return on investment from this is about 8% if you just take the savings to the energy bills at current prices. And this is where my problem arises uh, if there's going to be um, a collapse in the energy price. Um, if it is the case that we get a whole lot more gas and that all, all the... Um, <coughs> Pilker, one of the uh, climate change commentators, has written a book about this. And he says, the iron law is that economic development becomes before climate resilience. So let's be clear, if it's a clash between the two, economic development will always win. So <coughs> we have a problem there about the uh, savings, but there is an interesting one, though, that if the city-wide does it, then you start to get all sorts of other things, that this is a desirable place to live, there are fewer people going to hospital with coughs and colds, and, and uh, so on. And so suddenly, <coughs> the place, the, the kind of council tax that you could claim to have to live in this kind of conservation area writ large, <coughs> would be able to be, cap if it could be captured, would um, do something towards increasing the return, if only you could capture it. <coughs> now, the pension funds are very interesting. The pension funds are very worried about the current generation of students who are, le le who are leaving university with debts and saying when they take their first job, pension, put it on one side until I've paid off my debts. The next thing they've got uh, a, uh, a mortgage, and the next thing they've been working for 20 years with no pension. So the pension funds ha have made it clear that they're looking for an iconic investment in this place. <coughs> now, even if we got all the things lined up and the triple of the workforce, we would need a democratic mandate from the city and the university. So here are some of the quandaries and hurdles. <coughs> We're, we're, in, even anything like this as an engineering project would need political will and guarantees to pull off. Suppose we were halfway down it and there was a collapse in the energy price. Then all the numbers are out the uh, thing. So nobody would start on anything like this unless there was some form of guarantees. <coughs> also, all the Malthusian <coughs> fears of overpopulation, resource depletion, <coughs> um, climate, de uh, climate lack of resilience and that, these Malthusian things happen to come and go. And the Malthusians, remember, have had a 200%, two, sorry, a 200-year track record of 100% failure. Mm -hmm. If you can tell me any Malthusian prediction that has actually come to, whether it was Malthus himself, Jevons was saying what a disaster the end of coal was going to be just as oil was being discovered. The Club of Rome told us we're going to be out of half of our, the periodic table of minerals by 2000 and so on. So the, there is a distinct possibility that some of the drivers will uh, go away. As it was pointed out this morning, Obama did not mention climate in his State of the Union, but he did talk about energy efficiency. <coughs> and of course the worry for the UK is that if we put more and more gas, we get our gas at the moment from uh, Norway, but if we ever had to get it from Russia, then it does have a, an issue of national strategic interest that we would not want to be negotiating our 
uh, annual gas prices on the 1st of January. There's the distinct possibility of glut of shale gas, <coughs> whether or not cleaned or with and without uh, any form of carbon sequestration. <coughs> There's an also a very interesting set of holdouts against action. <coughs> if my mother is living in one of those houses and I want the proceeds of the estate for my purposes, why should I uh, contribute something for which I'm going to get no benefit from? unless there's a bit of a markup on the house, but I, you know, the chances are I can hold out and say no. <coughs> and then, should we wait uh, in 10 years <coughs> from now and aim not for a 30% first time round, but a 60% first time round? <coughs> the potential benefits for Cambridge of doing something like this has become uh, <coughs> an international exemplar. One of the big things of being first is anybody who does the monitoring, evaluation and feed forward that is a hugely valuable collection of intellectual property uh, that will be done for national rollout, uh, export, um, uh, and also export opportunity. <coughs> you know, we import a lot of solar and wind because we left it too light, late. And then the other thing, of course, which drives people in Cambridge is not actually this first 25%, but what do we do for the second and the third 25%, which have a much larger uh, research consideration. Cambridge University itself is not doing too well. Its uh, carbon footprint is going up like China. It's about to double uh, next year when Lord Sainsbury's plant breeding lab opens, new one. And so <coughs> there is a serious problem. And this has nothing to do with the buildings. This entire doubling is almost entirely due to the plug load of research. Uh, it's clean rooms, plant breeding, animal labs, and server farms. That's where all the energy is going. So I just conclude, the idea of retrofitting at an urban level <coughs> at this stage is a high risk but a high return one. <coughs> Local action on a global scale uh, like this, I mean the point is Cam if Cambridge did it and nobody else did it, why just, what's the gain for Cambridge? So this idea of local action on a global scale, I don't know, I could be corrected by the historians, I've not seen anything quite like it. <coughs> when faced with problems of this complexity there are always more pressing things. But it is interesting if you look back to see the way in which World War II was the thing that took the world out of its the global recession of the 30s. It was the sheer demand, come what may, but we don't have a real enemy yet. <coughs> the question is, could we really galvanise Cambridge for the next 40 years? Because this is a 40-year programme and it's an opportunity. And I just remind you that 40 years spanned the first Industrial Revolution and it's the right timescale to think of uh, being in a completely different place uh, in 2050, the time when students who graduate today will themselves be retiring. Thank you very much. <laughs>